Uh, case number 18, CA011391, Youngstown State University, and Ashley Kruick. Both sides are represented by counsel, so each side will have 15 minutes to present their arguments. Appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you're going to reserve time, let me know, and I'll uh, try to keep you appraised at the time. We've read the briefs, and we are ready to proceed with you. Uh, Emily White, I'm representing Ashley Crook in this matter. I would like to reserve five minutes uh, for rebuttal. Thank you. In this case, the trial court erred in concluding that Youngstown, Youngstown State University's representations to prospective students for its long-term care administrator bachelor's degree program were not misleading. And additionally, the trial court's analysis of the Consumer Sales Practices Act's um, application to Youngstown State University in this case was erroneous. Now, under the CSPA, which is our main um, state consumer protection against unfair and deceptive consumer acts, a deceptive representation is defined as one where the subject of the consumer transaction has sponsorship, approval, performance characteristics, accessories, uses, or benefits that it does not actually have. Um, and in this case, we're, we're primarily concerned with the approval, use, and benefits of Youngstown State University's representations. Now, in evaluating whether a statement is misleading, context is critical. Um, and an analysis is performed of the, of the statements um, that a supplier makes um, under an objective standard. What conclusions, what inferences would a reasonable consumer have drawn about these misrepresentations? Now, the Consumer Sales Practices Act also includes a separate provision, which we've also pled in this matter, for um, acts which are un unconscionable. Now, those acts um, would include uh, statements such as statements of, of opinion about the suitability of a particular consumer transaction for a particular consumer's needs. That does have a sign tear requirement. So in other words, there has to be um, an element of knowing, uh, knowing statements uh, from the supplier in that transaction. Um, we believe that, that that standard has been met as well, but, but either one, these are separate and independent uh, requirements by the Consumer Sales Practices Act. Now, in this case, my client, Ashley Crump, she wanted to be a state-licensed long-term care administrator, and she was eager to meet this goal as quickly as possible. She was uh, midway through uh, about to complete her associate's degree at Lorain County Community College. She lived in our community. She um, had worked at Kendall and Oberlin for, for many years. So she's somebody who, who was actually very knowledgeable about the field of study that she was about to enter, and she wanted to reach her career goal as soon as possible. Now, the road to become a licensed long-term care administrator in Ohio is, is uh, somewhat difficult. Reasonably, it's a very regulated profession. And in Ohio, it's necessary to pass both state and national licensing exams. And in addition, uh, we have a state agency called BELTS um, that, that actually promulgates the eligibility criteria for a, a potential person who wants to become licensed to practice in this profession. There are only two paths to become a licensed long-term care administrator. The difficult path, number one, is you can obtain a bachelor's degree in literally any field and then afterwards successfully complete a 1,500-hour unpaid internship in a setting that has been BELTS approved. So you have to have a bachelor's degree in anything, apply to BELTS and say, I want to be a long-term care administrator. I'm going to do this internship. Can you approve it? Um, in addition, uh, that person has to take a core of knowledge course. That process is lengthy and takes over a year after the applicant has already completed a bachelor's degree. The simpler and more straightforward path is number two. A graduate could, a person could graduate from an approved educational program with a degree in long-term care administration that was approved by the state licensing board. In this case, Youngstown State University offers a bachelor's degree in long-term care administration. Its promotional materials to students expressly stated that its program would prepare graduates to become licensed nursing home administrators and that its graduates would be eligible to sit for state and national nursing exam, uh, national licensing exams. Specifically, um, the, the promotional materials said the primary focus of the long-term care administrator program at YSU is to prepare students to become licensed uh, administrators in nursing homes or convalescent homes. And repeatedly, Youngstown State's promotional materials told prospective students that licensed graduate, that graduates of the long-term care administration program are eligible to become assistant administrators, 
And they also said that graduates of the program are eligible to sit for national and state licensure exams. So in the context that I just described, of there's a long path and an easy path, my client looked at those promotional materials and those representations about what this program would do for its prospective graduates and reasonably thought that this was a, a program that met the requirements of number two, that this was an improved uh, program and its graduates would in fact be eligible to sit for state and national licensing examinations. My client's conclusion, Ashley's conclusion, is not unreasonable in light of those, in, in light of the, the um, context of the regulated profession that my client was training for. And I'd like to highlight some language um, from a case that actually predated the CSPA, but I think it's instructive in looking at the objective context here. Um, in Barron versus the state of Ohio, the trial court there said, it's not unreasonable for one matriculating to an institution of higher education, of higher learning, which offers course materials and degrees in a certain professional field to assume that credits taken uh, for, uh, for credit for courses at such an institution and any degree thereafter that might be granted would qualify that student or graduate for the appropriate state professional examination. Now, that case concerned um, Ohio University apparently had an architecture program that lost its accreditation uh, midway through, um, through students' uh, participation in the program. And some promises had been made that if there was going to be an attempt to seek accreditation, and those promises, um, well, attempts were made, but the, the promise was not met. In fact, the, the accreditation was not uh, received. That was not a CSPA case, but I think it's still instructive for that fundamental expectation that a student would have in this particular consumer transaction that whenever representations are made about um, especially state licensing requirements in a heavily regulated profession, that when a, an institution of higher education says this program will prepare, prepare you to be a licensed professional in this field, uh, that, uh, well, it's misleading if, if those, uh, the program does not. The trial court's analysis and its conclusion that those statements were not misleading was based on two fundamental misunderstandings about YSU's statements and about the licensing and certification process. It's apparent in the trial court's analysis that the court seemed to think that the additional internship and coursework was required for all candidates. Um, they, the court just did not seem to realize that graduates of approved programs really were entitled to sit for the exam right away. They would not have to go and spend an extra year of their lives doing an additional internship and a core of knowledge course. So to the extent that the court's um, decision was premised on the idea that that was not required, they were wrong. Um, additionally, the court clearly, uh, as, did, as did YSU in its, in its briefing, conflated YSU's 1,000 hour internship requirement with the entirely separate BELT's uh, 1,500 hour administrator and training internship. That confusion is understandable. That confusion about what that, the significance of that training program actually did confuse my client into thinking that it was um, the, the, the uh, thousand hour internship program that, that YSU offered would in fact help advance her on her goal towards um, being eligible for this certification program. It did not, nothing that my, my client did in fact successfully complete the thousand hour internship through YSU and none of those hours counted, none of those hours counted towards the administrator and training internship that she's spent a year of her life this year completing after she successfully graduated. Now, YSU has argued that there was no intention to mislead and that the, the CSPA does not impose a scienter requirement on a supplier for deceptive misrepresentation about the benefits, approval, or sponsorship of the subject of a consumer transaction. However, um, as, I've, as I've just explained, there are two separate and independent uh, sections of the CSPA that we have pled and that are implicated here. Um, even, even the authority that, that YSU cites, the Truchel decision, uh, specifically states the court quotes and recognizes a consumer is not required to demonstrate that the supplier intended to be unfair or deceptive when it's making representations about benefits or uses of its program. Additionally, though, the scientific requirement does apply to statements of opinion, but, but the way that it applies is the supplier had to intend that those statements would influence a consumer in making that decision about whether to enter into this transaction. And looking at these statements, we were on a motion to, to dismiss um, procedural posture at the time that this, this uh, decision was granted. In this case, I, I think a reasonable person could look at the statements that YSU made in its promotional materials and think 
that they were trying to influence students to think that their program would prepare students to become licensed long-term care administrators. That, that, that would satisfy the scientific requirement. They intended um, to make a statement about the suitability of their program, and they intended prospective consumers to rely on that statement in deciding whether to enroll in YSU's program as opposed to Bowling Green State University's program, because this was, in fact, a competitive marketplace. Now, I would like to also address um, two additional assignment of errors that YSU has chosen not to address at all in its briefing. Now, um, you can do that, but yes. your total time left is 5 minutes and 13 cents. About 13 seconds now. Okay. But Thank you, Judge. So you know I, where you're at. If, if, I'll just take a minute and try to, to okay. address it in about two minutes. Um, so the trial court erred in concluding that, um, that this course of study was not even a consumer transaction and in its analysis of whether the Consumer Sales Practices Act applied. Now, number one, higher education is and has been clearly recognized as a consumer transaction. Um, I've supplied plenty of cases uh, to that effect. Uh, Malone uh, versus uh, the, the court reporting case is one of them. Um, and, and you have them. Higher education is a consumer transaction. While it may be a benefit to the society as a whole or provide employment benefits, we have a definition of consumer transaction. That's a service that's provided for primarily personal or household use. And we also have plenty of authority saying that when a student enrolls in college, that's a contractual relationship. The college agrees to provide the service, the student agrees to pay for it, the college then has to provide that service. And nothing about that changes in this case. Um, so in, in other words, the trial court erred in concluding that, that YSU was not a supplier and that this was not a consumer transaction. Additionally, the trial court's analysis of the applicability and jurisdiction to decide a CSPA case was erroneous. Uh, the trial court uh, concluded that uh, they, they applied what they called the market participant test to determine whether a state institution of higher education uh, should be subject to the CSPA. So I've explained in my briefing, the CSPA is a special um, exception to the sovereign immunity doctrine that predates by three years the Court of Claims Act, which specifically said this waiver of sovereign immunity does not, does not um, alter uh, prior waivers of sovereign immunity. And in passing the CSPA, the, um, the legislature specifically included government entities or subdivisions as, um, as, supply, as persons who are subject to the act and can be suppliers. The trial court uh, said that uh, a market participant test should apply as to whether a, a state entity is a, um, is a supplier or not. Now, that was borrowed from another case, which the, the Barron's decision, which borrowed it from a, another, from, from dormant commerce clause analysis. It really has no bearing in this case. And, and one part of the trial court's analysis was particularly disturbing. They said that the test for whether um, something is a, is a uh, whether the CSPA applies, is whether the supplier has unfettered discretion about whether to choose its students. And the court took particular um, concern that because YSU is not permitted to discriminate on the basis of protected class, that it somehow didn't have unfettered discretion subject to, to being a market participant. That, that analysis is out of left field, has no place in, in CSPA jurisprudence, is not necessary to reach any decision in this case, and the trial court erred in adopting it. Um, I will try to reserve the rest of my time. Thank you. Two minutes and 25 seconds. All right, counsel, you'll have 15 minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. The, uh, the time. My name is Jeffrey Miller on behalf of Youngstown State University. Uh, and I will be brief. Uh, the, the decision of the trial court dismissing the case uh, for plaintiff's failure to state a claim upon which uh, relief may be granted uh, must be affirmed. Uh, this is a, a single count complaint for a violation of the uh, CSPA. Uh, the CSPA was enacted to prohibit deceptive and unconscionable uh, action practices. The plaintiff's complaint does not articulate any deceptive or unconscionable acts or practices. Standard of review before this court is de novo, and in three uh, simple examples, so we're confined to the complaint, I can show you why the, uh, the decision of the trial court must be affirmed. Paragraphs 9, 11, and the exhibits of the complaint. In paragraph 9 of the complaint, plaintiff acknowledges that uh, Prospective nursing home administrators must meet certain educational requirements, then apply to the Ohio Department of Aging Board of Executives of Long-Term Services and Supports, also known as BELTS, uh, and pass an exam. Uh, in paragraph 11, plaintiff identifies a primary method 
for, uh, for uh, receiving the, the um, certification from BELLS, which is known as the Administrator in Training. And that's a three-prong requirement. Prong one is a bachelor's degree from an accredited college or university. Prong two is a core of knowledge course. And prong three is the 1,500 hour administrator and training internship. Now in exhibit one attached to the complaint, Youngstown State's program description is for a long-term care administration major. It's in exhibit one, it's repeated in exhibit two in the Lorraine Community College um, uh, handout. It's a long-term care administration major. That's an important to note, and I'll come back to that in a minute. What it does, it discusses the preparation to become an administrator for a nursing home and also for retirement communities and other related healthcare industries. It provides that graduates of the long-term care administrator program are eligible to sit for national and state licensure exams. On page two of exhibit one of the long-term care administration major, it provides that this program graduates will receive a Bachelor of Science in Applied Science. Therefore, the long-term care administration major satisfies the eligibility requirement, the educational eligibility requirement, set forth in paragraph 11 of plaintiff's complaint. Plaintiff has not alleged anywhere in the complaint that the long-term care administration uh, major fails to satisfy the educational requirement. It would require an allegation that either it's, uh, it doesn't provide a bachelor's degree or that Youngstown State is, is not an accredited university. Neither of these are present in the complaint. Therefore, on its face, through paragraphs 9, 11, and the exhibits, plaintiff's complaint absolutely fails to state a claim upon which relief may be granted. Now, the, the erroneous uh, substance, or uh, the of plaintiff's complaint, is, is found in paragraph 12. In paragraph 12 of the complaint, plaintiff describes the alternative option, describes her confusion, describes uh, the, the, the errors of, of bringing this complaint. That alternative option, <coughs> excuse me, to become a nursing home administrator is if the Ohio Department of Aging Board of Executives of Long-Term Services and Supports, also known as BELTS, approves a nursing home administrator program. All right, that's all caps, and it's in paragraph 12, it's a specifically defined term. I do have to point out that my esteemed colleague in our argument erroneously cited that, that BELTS would, would um, approve a long-term care administrative program. That's simply not the case, and their complaint accurately identifies what BELTS approves. If the candidate completes the NEHAP or the Nursing Home Administrator Program, then the candidate does not need to complete the core of knowledge or the $1,500 hour internship. I'll get that right at some point, uh, saying it correctly. Uh, it's a different program. It's a different certification entirely. Uh, now, in order, what apparently Ms. Kruick has interpreted uh, the, the statements by, by Youngstown states that graduates of the long-term care program are eligible to sit for state licensure exams, meaning meeting the educational requirement, it re would require a quantum leap to have the interpretation along the lines of that the Ohio Department of Aging Board of Executives of Long-Term Services and Supports, BELTS, has determined that the capitalized long-term care administrator program of YSU is actually an approved nursing home administrative program under the rules and regulations of BELTS, and therefore YSU graduates do not need to complete the core of knowledge course program or the 1,500-hour internship before taking the Ohio licensure exam. Now, nothing in the complaint, none of the exhibits to the complaint, none of the statements from uh, YSU or even the, the Lorraine Community College handout reference BELTS reference Ohio Department of Aging, reference the, uh, uh, the, the Board of Executives of Long-Term Services and Supports. Nothing says that you're, you're uh, uh, relieved of completing the core of knowledge. Doesn't even reference core of knowledge. Nothing says that you're relieved of the 1,500-hour internship program. And nothing says, most importantly, that this is a qualified nursing home administrator program. Now, as I said, in order to have a, a, a successful uh, complaint or an actionable complaint, um, previously they would have to say that Youngstown State 
which is not accredited or did not provide a master's, for this count to survive, they would have to show somewhere that Youngstown State said, we are providing you with a degree in the, in the nursing home administrator program. And it's not there. It's not even referenced there. None of the key terms are referenced in there. So, as my esteemed colleague identified, in evaluating whether an act is deceptive or unconscionable, it's, it's what a reasonable person will evaluate. It's, the, it's looking at the ordinary meaning. And as the trial court correctly found, it would take such a quantum leap to take uh, what, what Youngstown State provided, is that graduates are eligible to sit for national and state licensure exams. To now make that leap to mean that even though it's not a nursing home administrator program, we're deeming it as a nursing home administrator program and relieving you of the obligation, uh, it's too tenuous, it's too much of a stretch, it's too much of a leap that the plaintiff failed to state a claim upon which relief can, may be granted. So uh, in evaluating it on a de novo uh, approach, we ask that the, that the decision of the trial court be affirmed and that, uh, and that the, um, uh, the matter be, be uh, terminated. Thank you, Your All right, thank you for your argument. And counsel, you have two minutes and 25 seconds left on that rebuttal time. Um, I'd just like to, to direct your attention to um, one of the paragraphs in the promotional materials that, that YSU provided to prospective students. The primary focus of the long-term care administrator program at YSU is to prepare students to become licensed administrators in nursing and convalescent homes, retirement communities, and related healthcare industries. That is exactly what my client wanted to do. That is exactly what she thought that this program would, would qualify her for. But in fact, this program was did not actually uh, permit her immediately to sit for the required state and national licensing exams. Whereas other programs um, that in which YSU was in competition, such as Bowling Green State University's program, uh, would have in fact permitted her to, to, to sit for those exams right away. Do they, do they represent themselves to be accredited by belts? It's not, it's not accredited by belts. It's a program whose course of study is approved such that graduates are, are eligible to immediately sit for the exam. So it's not an accreditation program, but it is at belts. belts. I mean, I mean at, yes. at Bowling Green. Yes, Bowling Greens is approved, as are as are almost every other program of its nature offered. Uh, I'm not going to. I don't know all of them, but everyone that other of them. You just keep referring to Bowling Greens. So I figure they must yes. be doing something that represents themselves differently. From no, it, it's another example. I think of a comparable institution, state institution of higher education, that offers a similar program, and it is one that my client was actually looking at and comparing where could she meet her career goal. Um, at a state institution of higher education living in Northeast Ohio, um, or in Northern Ohio at least. Um, I'd like to also draw a comparison also to, um, uh, Council for YSU has, has uh, tried to draw comparisons with a number of other um, cases. Um, and I, I do believe that, these, that the other cases that involved either accreditation or promises about uh, qualifications uh, to, to sit for the licensing exams actually support our cases. One of them that was discussed at length um, that I'd like to talk about briefly is the Spafford case. This was a case with a Tri-C Community College student who uh, sought to pursue a particular uh, health program degree and she was promised a certificate. Now, the, uh, a directed verdict was granted after a jury trial in favor of Tri-C. Personally, I disagree with the conclusion the court drew, but, but my disagreement is not important for, for the portion of the, of the analysis that I'd like to cite here. The trial court in granting that and the appeals court in upholding that uh, decision uh, noted specifically that Tri-C, as they said, did not state that completing its program would result in registration or qualification for the required <coughs> licensing exam, the BRPT exam. In order to be registered by the state, a student would have had to pass that exam. In order to be qualified to take the exam, 18 months of work experience in the field was required. And then the court concluded that a student's subjective belief that this, this specific training program would qualify her was unfounded, it was unsupported, that there hadn't been a specific representation made by that institution of higher education that it would be qualified, that the program would qualify her. Here, YSU specifically represented that if this pro passed this program as she did, that she would be eligible to sit for state and national licensing exams, which in fact she was not. And had this program actually been an approved program, she would have. And it's, it's that context that led to the reasonable inference of, of Ms. Crook 
that this program would qualify her. And I'd like to direct your attention again to the, um, some of the authorities I've cited about... Um, well, Council, you're out of time. So. Okay. Thank you. I we'll, would ask, we'll look. Yeah, I would ask that, that the decision be reversed and remanded for further proceedings. Thank you. All right. Thank you both for your arguments today. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue its decision in due course. The clerk of courts will certainly mail each of you a copy of the decision uh, on the day it's released. You can also keep an eye out on the Ohio Supreme Court's uh, website which also posts the decisions. Uh, again, thank you both for your arguments. Thank you, Ron.